Well, imagine a device, a device that allows you perhaps to calculate time. Some might refer to this as a clock. Imagine also a device that allows you to not just calculate the time, but also perhaps to move through time. Imagine that this device also requires plutonium. Imagine that this plutonium requiring calculating time moving device is stolen by a bully. Imagine that this bully then games the future to buy a shit ton of banks, yachts, and chicks. Imagine then that this bully perhaps could erase you from your own lineage and history. You thought I was referring to Back to the Future. I was in fact referring to Tenet. Do you realize Tenet is a palindrome? I palindrome, I. And in fact, the entire movie is a palindrome, brah. The movie is structured like the word. <laughs> so as you're moving through this movie, in the middle of the movie, the movie reverses. <laughs> Tenet stars. Christopher Nolan as Father Time, Biff as the Russian oligarch, Black Science Man as Flavor Flav, the Disney clock as time itself. It also stars Nietzsche as Eternal Return, Gandalf as Grandfather Time, and pay attention to the Grandfather Paradox. I can't decide whether I like this movie or not. Uh, I think Christopher Nolan wanted to do something philosophical, but something happens, I think, when you like plug into a movie, everything that normies think is deep. What are the, what are the, I'm just spitballing here. Let's see. Quantum shit. Uh, flux. Uh, multiverse. Uh, what are the other modern mythologies? AI. Um, nano. Nuclear. Nuclear. Uh, radiation. What are some other cloned Can you think of anything else imagine we put all of these into a quantum shit flux multiverse AI nano nuclear radiation clone generator and it spit out a movie about quantum shit flux multiverse AI nano nuclear radiation clone what movie might we have Imagine that movie itself is a palindrome. I don't mean they might be Giants level palindrome. I palindrome, I. I mean a movie itself structured like a freaking palindrome, brah. Is your mind blown? Let's talk about it. Because I know a lot of you nerds out there are trying to figure out this movie. This movie is the most confusing movie I've ever seen in my life. I consider myself a premier movie detective. I have two books on decoding and de detectivizing in movies. I'm probably the best in the world, to be humble about it. Imagine. Imagine a movie that com combines all of this. Now, let's think about Chris Nolan's previous movies. We've got Insomnia. I'm not going to count the art house film. Uh, Inception, The Prestige, The Batman stuff. Let's, what would Bane do? 
I was, I was born inside the womb of Arachne herself, spinning webs of confusing, impossible films. Right. By the way, we will refer to the... the I am going to give an esoteric analysis. I do think there's an Arachne web element to this of fate. But I'm also going to point out some of the flaws in this movie. I think they're pretty obvious and try to decode it. Um, so I like and don't like it at the, at the same time. Uh, my analysis itself is a contradictory palindrome of this movie. I like it, and then in reverse, I don't like it. Um, for one, multiple worlds, which is thrown into this in the middle of the movie, is incompatible with cyclical eternal return. So both of these are present in the film. That They pop up often in Christopher Nolan films. Christopher Nolan loves the idea of the flat circle. Imagine time and space is just a flat circle. We're all just stuck doing the same thing over and over. I know, right? We know. I know that's not Christopher Nolan. I'm just saying it's the same. I mean, it is Christopher Nolan in Interstellar, right? Remember? Uh, old, old boy goes from... True detective up into space, taking that Lincoln up into space to just be in a circle loop tesseract, looking in, peeping in, creeping and voyeuring on himself from outside of time and space. <laughs> he's stuck. He's, he's stuck in the Matthew McConaughey voyeur loop where he's just looking at himself from all eternity from outside of time and space in that, in that sexy little tesseract. I'm going to take this tesseract into space. But what happens when Eternal Return tries to combine with multiple worlds? It's just too much, dude. You should have. I mean, the previous films, they worked because they didn't have all of this gibberish gobbledygook pseudoscience. And I'm sorry. Uh, some of this is pseudoscience, right? So that's not the only reason, though, that this film is worth critiquing. There's also positive aspects of the film that do hit on Twilight language. You know that from Jay's analysis, we reference Twilight language quite often. So let's get into the good and the bad here. So palindrome, that's interesting. Okay, let's make a movie that's a palindrome. Nobody's ever done that before, to my knowledge. Oh, wait, except that it's kind of like Memento. Actually, this whole movie is back to the Inception, Memento, Future, Part 2. But, again, it's still worth watching. Uh, we have references to the Twilight World, the Twilight World. We're in the Twilight World. This has a double sense to the uh, intelligence, deep state type of black ops operations that are going on in the world, black markets, this kind of stuff, and to the deeper archetypal layer to this movie. We know that, you know, Christopher Nolan and his bro, they love archetypes. They love Carl Jung. We know all of that. That's in every one of the Nolan films. I've covered that ad nauseum. Go watch my, or did we do, I think we did, we did a show on Inception. Uh, if you go watch the episode of uh, Hollywood Dakota that we did, we did do an Inception installment. I also did an old essay on Inception. You can find it on my website, but we have references to uh, the, the new Cold War. The new Cold War in this setting of the film is uh, it is against Russia, but it's against a Russia that has obtained future tech that is able to send plutonium bars back in time or something. It's super confusing. I don't really know what the heck is going on in this movie other than the uh, palindrome cyclical return moving back through time moving forward in reverse, uh, which leads to some dumb things, by the way. Number one, uh, so if you are going back in time, you're moving forward back in time, physical and metaphysical things would not become the opposite of themselves. Okay, Heat does not become cold. Breathing does not become non-breathing. That, make, that makes no sense. Because if you're going to do that, then everything else would also be reversed, right? Eating would be puking, okay? That makes no sense. That, that was silly, right? I mean, and, and if you're going to reverse things, I mean, wouldn't you reverse? <laughs> like, wouldn't you be turned inside out? <laughs> it just it, the, the logic of that makes no sense. And by the way, why does that blonde chick uh, in the final 
20 minutes not require her face mask. That doesn't make any sense because in order to go back, you, you, your lungs, the air is inverted. Right? Anyway, setting aside those uh, continuity issues, we have a new Cold War that is a sub-Twilight language theme here with Russia, a Russian oligarch. Russian oligarch who's come to uh, London has obtained this tech. He can send things back in time, and he's figured out how to create some super nuke that's going to blow up all time and space. Um, it's plutonium. I'm sitting here thinking, literally, this guy's Biff. He's just like Russian oligarch Biff. 1.21 gigawatts. Marty, 1.21. It took 1.21 gigawatts for me to try to figure out what's going on. Like if you had hit me with 1.21 gigawatt, 1.21 gigawatts, I would not be able to figure out the plot of this movie because does the guy die? I mean, he, in the middle, he's like blown up in a freezing explosion because fire inverts in the reverse world. It's cold. Uh, and then he wakes up in the, Shipping crate. I mean, there's like two death scenes. I it just, I, I don't understand what's going on here. So, um, there are some interesting reversals in this uh, reverse world. So I do think we have. If you watch Twin Peaks, you know that in Twin Peaks you kind of get you get the Black Lodge and you have what the where things go in reverse, right? And of course, David Lynch supposedly had this uh, esoteric meaning behind why he did that. And you've got some of that here. You get the idea that we're, we're entering into an alternate reality that is the uh, inverse world where things are moving in reverse. That's how they justify it with alternate multiple worlds. But then again, I thought we were in a cyclical flat circle of eternal return. Again, those two things don't make sense. They're not possible. But what's most interesting is the uh, Twilight references to uh, the Cold War with Russia, the new Cold War. British intelligence being involved in fostering this with the Michael Caine character. Go and do what you kind of can do at the help of the behest of British intelligence. Black science man, go do what you can and can't do. Right. B Michael Caine shows up. He represents British intelligence. The shiny, sparkly vampire dude shows up. He's the co-agent. And it was obvious to me from the outset that it was uh, the black dude and uh, the, the Robert Pattinson vampire dude the whole time. Right? I, I mean, I didn't even get I, I didn't even see a trailer, but it was just obvious that they were in the suits interacting with themselves at the very beginning of the movie. I mean, it was just to me, it was obvious Um the art world is a cover for Black Operations uh, Liquid Cash. That's it. That was an interesting element that showed up. I already knew all that. We've covered this kind of stuff for years. Um, but the, the, the esoteric element that I do want to get to in the movie is the, the not so much all this uh, quantum foam gibberish, but rather the Gnostic imagery here. So as we know, Carl Jung very much uh, father of archetypal philosophy in the sense of modernity, uh, very much the, the uh, into the idea of eternal return, all that kind of stuff. What you have here with the Russian oligarch guy is the demiurge. And that's very clear when he's on the phone at the end of the film, spoiler alert, and he's, he's relaying to the black dude that it was his plan to go back in time and rid, get rid of himself because humans are bad. Humans have uh, created nukes and all of this, uh, uh, you know, environmental devastation. So the humans need to be wiped out. And he says this and he says, and perhaps I am God and I have created all of this and I've created a son and I brought my son into a world that I will then destroy. So in other words, it's like the normie atheist Gnostic conception of the creator God, which is that he brings a son into this world, right? human type of Jesus creature that we never see. He's the architect and the creator, the artificer of temporal space and time. There's a Kabbalistic Gnostic element in the sense that he pieces back together the secret tech that allows you to have domination over time and space. That's always present in Kabbalistic and Gnostic themes is that the 
the God technology that gives you power over the spatial temporal limitations. It's like, you know, a role playing game and you got to LARP and find the, spe the, the pieces of the special tech like Thanos, right? The, you assemble your infinity glove and then you can have dominion over time and space, right? And so Manhattan Project, all of that was a part of assembling the algorithm. I, I forgot to add to my uh, uh, bullshit sci-fi generator uh, um, tech, the idea of the algorithm. That was one of the key terms that we got to throw in our, our uh, stew that will spit out a sci-fi movie there. The algorithm. So once you've solved the algorithm, you can piece back the tech, and you can control time and space. This is all just rank silly Gnosticism, but it does raise one interesting point. Isn't it fascinating, as the director of uh, Hardware said, that almost all of Hollywood and all of its, its films are premised on Gnosticism. Isn't it interesting that Gnosticism itself is a archetypal pattern and basis of Christianity. I'm mean, saying that it's a perversion. It's based on Christianity and it's like Neoplatonic uh, variations on what Gnosticism is very similar to Neoplatonism and different forms of uh, you know, polytheism, henotheism or whatever. Isn't it interesting that they're all derivations of the Christian structure? So even Gnosticism itself seems to presuppose and be based on archetypal patterns that it's borrowed from Christianity. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, and that leads me to think that in, in terms of limitations in narrative structure, which is archetypes, Northrop Fry, this kind of stuff, you really are limited and ultimately even literature seems to point to Christianity. So uh, yeah, that's my take. I give it uh, three out of five uh, Flavor Flav clocks. That's what this movie gets. If you like this analysis be sure to click subscribe and give me a thumbs up down below also be sure to check out jay's analysis uh, and definitely click